inner part, your, the heart, the seat of man, not your stomach, but, but your inner <laughs> man. <laughs> Verse number 13, now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what and communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel or an unbeliever? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, being the world, being the unbelievers, and be ye separate or set apart, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you. Get that. He says he'll be a father unto you. And you shall be my sons and my daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Let's bow our head. Father, we just thank you, Lord. For everything you do, we give you the glory and honor. Father, we ask that you would just bless us tonight. Bless us with your word. Bless us with your presence. Bless us with your touch. Lord, let the power of the Holy Spirit be upon us tonight. Lord, if there's any sin in our lives, anything that we have done, oh God, we ask that you would forgive us of it, that you would touch us and move upon us. And Lord, that we may give you the glory and the honor tonight for everything that will be said, everything that will happen. And we'll thank you for that. In Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. amen. The fatherhood of God. God who at one time dwelt in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle in the wilderness, later on to dwell within the Holy of Holies, within the temple. And God, before the cross, dwelt in a, in a building that was built for Him so that He might come and be in the midst of His people so that He would present a, a type of that which was to come. When we began to look at the sacrifices that was given in Israel, we began to look at the, the, the ceremonial sacrifices that were offered. They were offered in faith looking toward a coming Redeemer that would one day remove the sins from God's people. But God makes a promise to His people. He says, one day I will come and I will indwell you as a believer. And that day did come when Jesus came and He hung between the heaven and the earth and He died upon the cross of Calvary for mine and your sins. And the way into the Holy of Holies was made when the temple veil was, was rent from the top to the bottom. And, it's, and, and historians Josephus tells us that it was as a man's hands took that, that temple. Ten yoke of oxen could not have pulled that piece of wool curtain apart, but it looked like the two fingers had grabbed it at the top and tore it like a sheet paper what God was saying because my son has been sent and died upon the cross of Calvary for mine and your sins God was saying I am opening up the way unto you that if you will believe upon my son if you will believe upon Jesus Christ whom I have sent I will come and I will dwell inside of you how many of you know tonight that every single person that has been born again every single person that, that names the name of Christ that has had the regeneration experience 
that God Himself has come to dwell and to live inside of your heart. And yet, we walk around and we live in this flesh and we take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis that God lives inside of us. Some people might be asked and say, did you know that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? And flippantly, a lot of people will say, well, yeah, I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. God dwells in me. But yet, we fail to recognize the greatness and the goodness of a great God who created the heavens and the earth, who made it all real, who planted Himself inside of mine and your life, who came alive inside of you and I. So think about this when He says that He will dwell in a temple that is not made with hands. He's talking about indwelling you and I. He's talking about indwelling this flesh. He's talking about taking up His abode and His throne upon our heart. And our heart becomes the throne of God on the inside as we begin to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to us who is, who is trying to rule and trying to reign in man in your life. This is how come Paul would talk to these Corinthians. And listen, the Corinthian church had some real problems. Just like every church has real problems today. If you and I could pull the top off of congregations, if you and I could pull the top off of people that sit in, in churches on a Sunday basis, and we could look down into their lives the way God looks down into their lives, we would be appalled sometimes by the, by the people that we think are so right with God, but yet there's these secret sins in their lives. There's these things that they're not willing to divulge. There's things they're wrestling with. There's things that, that are done in secret that it's a shame to talk about out in the public, but yet God sees all of these things. He looks down in mind in your lives and He tries the reins of our heart and He knows our heart. He knows whether or not our heart is pure. He knows whether or not your heart is sold out unto Him. He knows whether or not your motives are in the right place. And listen, there's been times that I thought my motives were in the right place. There's been times that I thought I was doing something in the, the name of God. There's been times I thought I was doing something in the, in the idea of righteousness. But later on, I look back in it and I begin to see how selfish I was. I begin to see how terrible, miserable I was as I was really seeking a self-gratification or maybe I was trying to lord over somebody else because they did, they wasn't exactly where I was or at least I didn't think that they were and I was trying to make them right I was trying to lord over them while me myself on the inside was sick with sin and sick with disease in my heart and not right with God that's how come it says listen don't you try to pull the speck out of your brother's eye until you get the big log you try to get the, the big mold out of your eye don't you be accusing. Don't you be blaming. Don't you be selfish. Don't you be trying to lord your righteous uh, acts over somebody else because God deals with each and every man as He will. He tells them, He says, listen. Listen to your bowels. Listen to the inside. Listen to the, the, the inside that you're that you be straightened on the inside. That you've been, you be straightened to that narrow way inside of your bowels to where you begin to have a, a self-examination of your heart. You begin to look at your own self. Not your brother. Not your sister. Not your kid folks. But you begin to look at you. See, we have this problem in the church all the time of trying to look at other people and trying to judge other people and try to make them right. But honey, let me tell you, without the cross of Jesus Christ, without Christ crucified upon the cross, you can't even make yourself right tonight. You can't do it. I can't do it. Only the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary can make you or I right with God and make that dwelling place where God takes up His abode. A holy place fit for His dwelling. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. As the believer believes upon the Lord and he places his faith in what no man could do. And no man could do it. Only Jesus could do it. Only Jesus was righteous enough to come and to hang upon a cross and to die for mine and your sins. Only Jesus could do that. I couldn't die for you. You couldn't die for me. It was only Jesus who makes us right. Only Jesus that we're accountable to for what's on the inside of here. And God works in His own ways and in His own timing in our lives. I've seen people who tried to lord their righteousness over other people 
only to find themselves miserably failing. I've seen people that thought that they were going to try to make somebody in their church or somebody in their neighborhood or somebody in their family. They were going to go preach to them and they were going to, they're not, they're not, they're not preaching to them, they're preaching down to them. Come on. They're preaching down to that person. And listen, listen, people know about their sin. People in the church know about their sin. They know they're struggling with some things. There's no doubt in mind if we could pull the top off in here, we would be shocked at some of the things that's in our own lives. You would be shocked. I, I've been, I've been, God's been good to me and my family because it seems like at every church we ever belonged to that blew up, we left before it blew up. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I left the church a few years ago. I took my family with me. We went and pastored somewhere else. And I went back to visit that church. About three years later, the pastor was showing me a new office that they had built. Showed me a whole new wing it built onto the building. I said, this is really nice. He said, it's really nice, but I won't get to enjoy it. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm going to resign. He said, there's been a squabble in this, in this congregation. And he said, there's nothing I can do about it. He said, I've tried to make peace among these people. He said, there's one family in this whole place that's stirring up trouble. He said, if that family would just leave, everything would be fine. Everything would go back to the way it is. But they're not going to leave. They're going to cause trouble. They're, they're spreading rumors about other people. And he said... I started once to fight this thing in the state, but he said, I've realized that I can't be effective behind the pulpit to these people anymore. So it's time for me to move on. It wasn't his fault. He didn't do anything. It was people in the congregation that had got into it with each other and trying to push his family onto one side or the other. And he was caught in the middle. And it didn't matter what he said in the pulpit. One, one of the other sides would, would have something to say against him. And, and yet he was trying to play the mediator in the middle of this. And I thought to myself when he was telling me all this. I said, thank God we were gone. Thank God we left. Thank God we wasn't in the middle of all of this. There's some, there's some real evils out there. And the devil, folks, I'm telling you what, the devil ain't down at the bar somewhere. He's holding a Bible. Sitting in the pew next to you. He's teaching you Sunday school class. Amen? He doesn't go to the bars and the honky tonks. He's got them. He goes to church. He's religious. He's a religious fanatic. He'll jump in there and he'll warp your mind. He'll, he'll cause division among the brethren. He'll, he'll get your children discouraged from going to church. He'll give your children a warped sense of view of God and, and eternity. And, and he'll, he'll try to warp your family into thinking, what's the use? Those people don't live any better than the world. That's what the devil does. The devil totes the Bible. The devil causes division among God's people. That's exactly what he does. He's not a honky tonker. He's not a bar hopper. He's a religious fanatic. That's exactly what he is. But God tells you and I that he comes and dwells inside of you and I. And so if he comes and he dwells inside of the believer, then it means we as church folks are to behave ourselves. Amen? Amen. Amen. Word behave yourself. Oh, I'm not talking about going out and sitting. I'm talking about our attitude. I'm talking about the, the way that we treat one another, the way that we treat our fellow brothers and our fellow sisters that listen, you've got to be in love in Christ. When you when you go to correct somebody, you've got to do it out of a pure heart. You've got to do it out of love. Listen, God's going to give them a chance whether you do or not. Amen. And I found that out years ago. You and I, we're trying to push somebody along. We're trying to make them live right. We're trying to change them. We think that somehow or another, this thing's going to happen overnight. And God sits up there and says, I'm going to take my own sweet time about it. Because when I bring them all on the other side, they're going to be better than they ever thought they could be. Amen? Amen. 
I believe there's some people. I believe there's some people that's got sin in their life. I believe there's some people that's going through some problems in their life. I believe there's people that's going through some health issues and some relationship issues and things such as that. But I promise you that if you will keep your faith in what Christ is doing on that cross, it doesn't matter who says what to you, but if you'll keep your faith there, when you come out on the other side, you're going to have more than you ever dreamed that you could have. Because He got it all for you through the cross of Calvary. I used to be careless. I'm still careless once in a while. But I'm learning some things. I'm learning some things. I'm learning that if I will have the, the right kind of attitude, Amen. the born again attitude on the inside, if I will not look at everything in such a negative light, if I'll not look at everything in my brothers, my sisters in Christ, and I'll begin to treat them with humanity, and I'll be I'll be humble and and have a, a spirit of humility upon me, and and be thankful and grateful for those that that God has placed into my life. And yes, I thank Him every day for the most wonderful congregation that meets on Thursday night that I know of anywhere. I thank Him for that. I thank Him on a daily basis for each and every one of you because I've seen the change. I've seen God working in your lives. Then I pray that that love spreads around in your life and that you learn to look at one another not with eyes and not with words of condemnation, but words that are uplifting words of love. Love, 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 love. Love never offends, does it? Amen. Love never offends. But the cross offends. Because the cross goes against the grain. The cross goes against working to try to do it. The cross goes against religion. You see, we've taught all our lives, we're taught to, to be independent, we're taught to work, we're taught to have good grades, we're, we're taught to perform, we're taught to function all the time. But yet in God's plan, God says, listen, all you have to do is believe and rest. All you have to do is believe and rest. You can't make yourself holy. You can't deliver yourself. You can't make yourself clean. You can't make anybody else. Why do you think you can do yourself? Right. You can't heal yourself. Only God can heal you. Only God can take away those things. And when you get to that point to where that you're no longer trying to fight and ravel this thing out for yourself, but you fall upon the mercy and the grace of the blood that was shed upon the cross for you, and God lives inside of you, God begins to say, there's some faith that I can recognize. There's some faith that has given up on self and has placed their faith. They fought the good fight of faith. They put their faith in what Christ has done for them. And the Holy Ghost says, there's a kind of faith that I can work with. I'm going to give them deliverance. Listen, it may not come tonight. It may not come next week. It may not come in a month. But if you will hold on to the old rugged cross of Calvary and say, yes, Lord, I believe. I believe. I believe for everything. He will come through and deliver you. Amen. I believe that's enough. So if I begin to live my life, and I began to live my life, I had to be careful not to be careless with my testimony. And with my, as the old King James would call it, my conversation. And that ain't talking about our words, it's talking about a lifestyle. Right. It's talking about the way we live. We have to be careful with our lives. Listen, if you will make the right choices, and you will come with the right kind of attitude, <coughs> And you will put your faith in what Christ has done for you on the cross. The world that God created for you to exist and dwell in will open up for you an opportunity. You'll begin to see opportunities laid before you. You'll begin to see things laid out there that, that if you walk in darkness, if you walk in neg negativity, if you, if you associate with the wrong people, if you allow the, the wrong kinds of seeds to be planted into your spiritual life, you will miss the goodness and the, and the blessing that God has for you in your life. 
If you begin to snarl and you begin to put down other people and you begin to talk about them and you begin to judge them and you begin to point the finger at them and say you could do better, listen, you're going to miss out on a whole lot of good things in this life. You're wanting to go to heaven. You're wanting to make it to glory. But listen, you ain't practicing too much of it down here. You better learn to practice the love of God down here. Amen. So that you'll be prepared to know how to do it when you get there. Amen. Amen? Amen. It's like my old daddy used to tell people all the time. He'd get around some of them old Baptist preachers and he'd say, Hey, ain't y'all ever shout around here? <laughs> I mean, my daddy, he's the biggest sinner in the world. But he, he'd say, They say there's going to be shouting and jumping and hollering in heaven. Yeah, you don't ever do none of that down here? Well, you better, you better get to practicing because you ain't going to know what to do when you get to glory. Amen. That is coming from an old sinful drunk. But he knew. He knew. He says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Now, boy, that could go in a lot of directions right there. Right? Lots of directions. Did you know you could, you could partner with somebody in business? You as a believer and them as a sinner. That ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. Because how can light be in fellowship with darkness? You're going to have trouble. You, if you listen to the Holy Spirit that speaks inside of you, that leads and guides and directs you. Sister Dottie said it over there the other day. You know, I was talking about that you need not have a teacher because the teacher dwells in you. She wasn't talking about you know trying to do away with a preacher or a Sunday school teacher. What she was having to say is that you've got one who lives inside of you, that one that dwells inside of you, that teaches you from right and wrong. And sometimes we, we try to belly up to the world. Sometimes we try to belly up and partner with darkness, whether we realize or not. And if you'll listen to the teacher on the inside, the teacher will tell you, don't have anything to do with it. Don't even entertain it. Amen. Keep your, keep your eyes on Christ. Don't entertain the things of this world. So you have to be careful who you buddy-buddy with, who you run with. Because people, people have a tendency to pull you down. Now I asked this question about five years ago and I lost the service. Was you there? I don't know whether or not. I asked it the wrong way. I said, how many of you ever caught any crabs? <laughs> and the whole church fell apart that night for five minutes. All of his mind flew off in the gutter. <laughs> Those people raised their hands, wasn't they? <laughs> they lost, wasn't they? Them were the glorious days. Man, we had people smoking pot, drinking beer, and hanging out at the church service. Them were wonderful times. They really was. We had a hundred folks out there wild as a buck. We didn't know what they was doing, did we, Don? But when we gave it, we had, we had some that sat under the car, poured into chairs like church people. And then we had some that stood out in the driveway and smoked their cigarettes and didn't know if they wanted much to do with us or not. And then we had that bunch that sat at the road on the hoods of cars and out on tailgates of trucks. But you know what? When we gave the altar call, it came from all three places. And all over the neighborhood. And all over the neighborhood. They sure did. God's a good God, ain't he? God? He's a good God. And her mama is the reason that we started it all. Harley's mama. She's the reason that we started all, started all of that. But God is, God is so good. He's good to us. And, and look, where, look where we're at now. But I asked that question out there that night and I wasn't talking about some sexual transmitted <laughs> critters. But I got their attention just like I got yours right now. You know, if you go crab fishing, and people are like this, if you go crab fishing and you want to catch you some crabs, you don't even have to have a lid for the bucket. All you have to have is two crabs. At least two crabs. If you can get at least two in the basket, at least two in the bucket, you'll never have to worry about putting a lid on it. 
Because when one of them tries to climb up out of that basket, the other crab will grab it by the leg and jerk it back down. <laughs> and we laugh about that. But that's exactly what we do in church. When somebody's trying to climb out of the crab basket, when somebody's trying to crab, climb out of their hole in life where they're at, instead of saying, Hey, have faith in Christ. Hey, we're here for you. Hey, we're behind you. We're going to love you. We're going to love you. We're going to support you. We, we try to drag them back down and say, no, no, no. No, you got to do this and you got to do that. And you got to walk down this narrow road. And you got to walk by this set of rules. And you've got to do all this kind of stuff. And we, we drag them back down right into the place to where we spiritually put oppression on them. You can't spiritually oppress people and them ever be free. Because if, if you think you have freedom by spiritual oppression, you're under a false imprisonment. Right. They've went from their sin to all of a sudden being falsely imprisoned into a place of false freedom where they think they're free in the Christ, but yet they don't know anything. But I'm going to tell you that when Christ comes in and He delivers you and you're allowed to grow and given room to grow, Giving room to grow. Somebody asked me the question Sunday about what I thought about this or that. And I said, listen, what I have found out is that you have got to give people room to grow in their experience with Christ. Amen. You don't, you may get everything you need to go to heaven in a, in a twinkling in a moment, in a, in a blinking of the eye. But it's going to take a lifetime to grow. I don't go out there and dig a little hole in the backyard and put in a, a, a corn seed and go out there the next day and, and, and that thing be full, full grown. And by the way, Tristan, that's not a pot plant in the backyard. Oh, I went and checked it out. I was curious how that was growing. We thought we had a stray pot plant growing in the backyard. <laughs> it was very convincing. It really did look good. I told her to leave it alone. We'll chop it up, make brownies, come up here and bring it. <laughs> People say, what kind of church have you got up there? <laughs> We're a happy church. <laughs> we brought her up the <laughs> Can't you see Lolo over here eating brownies stalled out of mine? That might make the headlines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what happened? I hope I don't offend any of y'all because I'm a big cut up. But you've got to give people room to grow. And as you're growing in Christ and you're growing in Him, you've got to be careful who you partner up with, who you belly up with because they can ruin you. Another example of being unequally yoked is a, is a boyfriend, a girlfriend. Or a husband and a wife. You've got one that's a believer and one that's a, an unbeliever. And, 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 and one of them says, well, well I'm going to win him over. I'm going to change him. Or I'm going to change her. I'm going to... Listen, you're not going to change nobody. They may change for a little while. But sooner or later, you're going to see who they were before anyway. Unless... Christ comes in and does a radical heart transplant on the inside. Amen. Amen. And then just as you learn in marriage, you learn about your spouse. And we've been married 30 years and I'm still learning stuff. She did something the other day. I can't even think what it was. I said, we've been married 30 years and I didn't even know that you liked that or something. I can't even remember what it was now, but I was just shocked. But... You've got to be careful in being yoked up with the wrong one because you can buy yourself a big lifetime of misery. Amen. Especially when children enter into the arena. Right. Then you've got to deal with that for a long time. And so you've got to be careful. You've got to, you've got to, to be sure. You've got to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that, that the, the person that you're being yoked up with, whether in business, whether in a, a friendship, whether in a buddy-buddy, or whether a marriage, whether a boyfriend or girlfriend, you've got to be sure that you're both equal and you both have that same experience on the inside. And then you've got to allow that person to grow. Isn't it amazing we always try to change people? I'm glad my wife hadn't tried to change me. <laughs> I 
I'm still the same person she married before. Loose cannon, crazy. I'm cuddly though. I'm lovable. But she'd tell you it's been 30 years of a roller coaster not knowing what to expect next out of me. Oh, nothing bad. Nothing bad. Just a few wild ideas now and then about things. You know, Evil Knievel was my hero growing up. I tried about anything. Once. But you've got to 